Hi folks, uh, today we're going to talk about how to operate and use the JASCO J815 circular dichroism spectrometer. This is an instrument that allows us to study different chiral molecules, uh, of which proteins are a major uh, representative, I suppose, um, especially in the secondary and tertiary structures um, where alpha helices have a specific handedness, uh, and we can also look at specific aspects of tertiary structure. So um, we're going to walk through how to work this thing and what kinds of things it can do for you in your research and in, in class. Okay, so the 815 uh, is relatively self-contained. It also uses a tank of nitrogen, which you need to turn on when you start this. It flushes out the optics. It keeps oxygen away. Um, oxygen is our main enemy for circular dichroism because it absorbs in the wavelengths that we want to study. And so you need to purge the, the tank, uh, purge the optics with nitrogen, which is over here. So be sure to turn that on. Most of the instructions for startup are here on the top of the instrument. Turn on the nitrogen, turn on the power switch. I already have that warming up today. And then turn on the temperature controllers if you're going to do a thermal experiment like a thermal melt, which uh, we'll do today as well. So to turn that on, you just have to switch this switch here to on, and then I also turn on the power on the thermal controller. So there's only a few switches to go um, to get this thing going, and then just let it warm up for a little while to get, uh, get everything going, and uh, then we'll move on to setting up the experiment on the computer. When it comes to the computer, uh, we are going to use Spectrum Manager, which is up here. And Spectrum Manager allows us to do all the operation of the instrument. To start with, I'm just going to do a basic CD spectrum, which is going to tell us about the helical content of a protein. Um, I'll just click on Spectrum Management here. Just let it initialize. Uh, that's going to get everything set up. Um, this will generally measure the difference between right and left polarized light, which happens as a result of chiral complexes. And since alpha helices and sheets are uh, specific in their chirality, we can detect them in different ways. And so what I'm going to do first is I'm going to set up parameters. Parameters is right here in the middle. And I'm going to set up my scan. I want to scan the whole spectrum from 190 to 350 nanometers, uh, one nanometer at a time, just to get a basic baseline of this, in, of this thing. And we'll show you some of the key features uh, as we do this. I'm using BSA as our control today, which is highly helical. Um, it has some sheet character, but mostly helix. So we'll see a nice alpha helical uh, spectrum today. I also want to be sure I'm measuring the CD. The HT essentially is uh, the gain on the photomultiplier tube inside of the spectrometer. Tells us kind of how many photons are hitting the detector and using that to adjust the gain to turn the volume up as fewer and fewer photons come through as oxygen starts to absorb them. Um, and then I'll just set a, go ahead and just make sure I have a baseline control. This is going to subtract out my blank. So I'm going to have a buffer um, scan separately. And I'm just going to hit OK. And then I'll show you how to set up our samples. All right, so for the instruments, we have a couple of different cuvettes you'll need to use. They're all quartz uh, so that light can pass through them. We have a 0.1 centimeter cuvette or a one millimeter cuvette, which is for small sample sizes, about 200 to 300 microliters should be sufficient for this one. It's very thin and easy to break, so be very careful with it. We're also gonna have to use a long stem pipette to clean it out between uses so that we don't cross contaminate. Um, what I have here is loaded with my buffer. Four circular dichroism phosphate buffers are the best. They're UV invisible, and so they won't interfere with your sample. But I'm still going to go ahead and take a baseline with this one. Okay, so that's already loaded and ready to go. We also have a standard one centimeter cuvette, a 10 millimeter cuvette, which is larger, and will obviously need a lot more sample. Um, but you can use either one for your application. For biochem stuff, we typically will use the smaller cuvette because it's um, appropriate for our sample sizes. And of course, when you're handling any of these, you want to be sure you wipe your fingerprints off, get the bubbles out of it. I like to tap them all out of there. Make sure everything looks good to go. And then I'm going to load them into my sample compartment. All right, so on the other side of the instrument, right here is our sample compartment. Sample compartment opens like this. And the cuvette holder is actually a little chamber here that is thermally controlled which we'll see when we do thermal melts and things. Uh, but we just need to take the lid off and stick it into the beam. The clear side of the cuvette needs to go into the path of the beam. Here's our um, detector and our light source. It needs to go like this, so we just need to be sure the clear part is there. And then just cover it up. And then we'll go back to the software to run it. Okay, for software, um, it's already set up from the, our method, so I just need to hit baseline measurement. Um, 
We need to measure the... Uh, If you look here, we're starting to see some change in cellular dichroism, but it's on the very small scale. This is between zero and two milladegrees of circular dichroism. So this is a very flat line. It's just showing all the bumps and lumps right now as it scans through. But when we subtract this out, it'll essentially be subtracting a flat line. But you just wanna let this thing scan through. All right, what we can see here from our blank spectrum is largely a flat line. Um, down here in the HT, which is our voltage on our photomultiplier tube, you can see it's pretty flat until it gets down here to about 200 when it starts to really ramp up. That's where oxygen is starting to absorb some of the photons and steal them from the photomultiplier tube. Uh, and so we need to turn up the gain so that more hits the actual detector. You should expect that when you do a scan. You also should expect maybe a little bit of circular dichroism as that gain gets turned up, as the noise gets um, amplified, but largely there's nothing happening here. So next step is to load your sample. So I'm just gonna go ahead and switch out the blank uh, for the actual BSA sample and we'll scan and see the difference. Okay, so we're gonna take our old sample out of here, lid off, and then I'm just gonna have to shake this out. Um, most of it, it's not gonna come out because it's one millimeter is too thin for even our pipettes to get down into. So we're going to have to be a little bit okay with just either blowing this out with some air or shaking it out as well as we can without dropping it. That's the biggest problem. Of course, these are pretty expensive little cuvettes, so you want to be as careful as you can with them. But if you do buffer first, it shouldn't be a big deal. The concentrations of protein you're going to want to use in CD are very low. Um, in the 0.1 mg per mil range is the best certainly below one. And so I've made up a bunch of about 0.2 just to see if we can get good signals all the way through that spectrum. And we only need about 300 microliters of that sample. Just enough to cover about halfway up the cuvette. That's 300 microliters. Um, so we don't use a lot of sample here. So this is now my uh, actual BSA. Remember that's mostly helical. Tap it down, make sure everything looks good. And then I'm gonna load it back into my chamber. Just anywhere in that path is fine. And then we'll close it up and then we'll take our regular scan. Instead of the B this time, we're gonna use the S, which is our sample measurement. And all you have to do is hit okay. And we're gonna let that go ahead and scan through the whole, uh, the whole spectrum. Again, it starts here at a low, uh, a low axis and it will scale as the peaks start to appear. So we'll just watch that happen. All right, so here's the classic appearance of an alpha helix protein. We have a big trough with two minima and one minimum here around uh, 205 or so and then one around 220. Um, the 220 is typically the one that's used to, to scan helices as they change but this is kind of what you would expect to see for an alpha helical protein. Beta sheets would have a single minimum at a different place and then unfolded proteins would have really no dips or peaks at all. Uh, so you can use these general appearances to kind of figure out what's going on. So once our sample was done scanning, uh, often this will just pop up automatically in our spectra analysis program. Uh, and we'll need to do a little bit of post-processing with this to be sure we convert the units from circular dichroism, which are kind of a raw scale, into something that's uh, comparable apples to apples. And so if you go to processing, down to CD options, you can go to optical constant. We have to put in a few different things for our concentration. And so I want to click on molarity and I want to get molecular ellipticity. And so I'm going to need a couple things. My path length here was 0.1 centimeters and my concentration I needed to calculate, um, but it's also going to want it in terms of every molecule's ellipticity. So I'll give it my general concentration, which was uh, 0.000036 molar. Uh, 3.6 milli uh, micromolar. One, two, three, four, five, six. That's uh, five zeros and a three, six. And then I also need to, um, I guess I can put this in here, 3.6 micromoles. And it's 609 residues. So it'll calculate my residue um, molarity, essentially how many total residues are in that, mo in that mix for me, which is kind of nice, and then hit OK, and it'll, trans it'll actually transform that data into molecular or molar ellipticity, which we can save. So I'm just going to save this uh, on my own 
as um, I mean, make a little folder for it. And let's say BSA mole. So that's how we would transform that data so we can actually scan its helical content. All right, so if we want to actually look at our data and like figure out how many present helix it is, how much uh, sheet it is, then what we're gonna wanna do is go to the multivariate SSE um, here under analysis and spectrum manager. And then I'm gonna wanna open my data and my model. So first I'm gonna go to file, uh, open, select model, open model. And in my CD data, I have a molar ellipticity calibration model which is built out of about 90 to 100 different standards in terms of their helix content that's been solved experimentally. And then all we have to do is load our spectra back here in file open. I'm gonna go to uh, my BUSA molar ellipticity that I just saved, and it'll spit out the helix content right there, which is 57.5% helix, which is right in, on board with what I expected. And then you can see it has some turns in it and then other content, which is probably unfolded or loops. Um, so. Largely, this is helix, and we expected that based on the, the appearance of its spectrum. So what we're gonna do next is we're gonna do a thermal melt on this BSA to see what its melting point is and observe what's going on with it uh, as it denatures. All right, to do a melt, what we're gonna wanna do is go to variable temperature measurement here in Spectrum Manager, and we'll let it come up. The only thing that might be a little bit weird for you is if the Peltier is not connected, it's going to give you an error. If that happens, just go to Control, select Accessory, and make sure the Peltier type cell holder is on, um, and that's, then it'll connect to it and be okay. Um, when we're doing a thermal melt, what we're going to want to do is uh, set the parameter so that we fully melt the protein. I'm just going to go from room temperature of 20 degrees Celsius up to 90, 5 Celsius per minute. Uh, 70 degrees divided by five, so a little bit over 10 minutes for this uh, to finish. And I'm gonna sample every one degree. And I'm gonna make sure I monitor the cell holder, uh, not the cell itself. We can't put the probe into the small cuvette. You could do it in the big one if you wanted. Uh, and then I want to have an end condition where we hold, come back and cycle back. So I'm gonna reverse, so to see if we're refolding correctly. Sometimes proteins will get aggregated um, if they are melted and denatured, which can happen. If you do reverse, you can tell if that's happening or not. So I'm just gonna collect that. That's gonna double my measurement time because it's gonna go up to 90 and then back down to 20. Uh, but it can be useful for us if we wanna know if it's reversible. Then uh, we want to pick our wavelengths. 220 is appropriate for alpha helices. Um, and pretty much that's all we need to do. So I'm just gonna save this as thermal melt. And then I'm going to run my sample and to start my sample here. Um, you can just go ahead and hit start if you want, if it's close enough to 20, or you can wait for it to equilibrate. But at this point, we're just going to wait 12 minutes or so and let this thing go. Um, so I'll report back when we're done. One last thing I didn't talk about is we need to set our cell length. We have a one millimeter cuvette that's going to affect our, our reading. So once you got that changed in there, then we can hit start. Um, and read the, start the, uh, the acquisition. All right, so what you see here is our response of CD to temperature. We're going from 20 to 90, and it's going up, as you see, and there's some inflection points in here, but it's a little bit hard to tell. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna jump over here to curve fitting, which is under processing, under common options, curve fitting, and this will pop up a window that looks like this, which is a typical looking, um, melting curve. So it has a sigmoidal shape and our melting point is in the middle of that somewhere. So if we go between here about 40, negative 40 and negative uh, 20, negative 30 will be right in the middle there. So I can just scan along and get a melting point of about uh, 67 degrees Celsius for this, which is our, which is effectively the, the halfway point between the two extremes. Um, we can get a little bit more precise here as we enter the curve. Here we are at about, uh, let's see, 30, negative 36 up to negative 18. That's nine degrees. Let's see, where are we at? Halfway point here, about 60, 69, somewhere in there. It's about halfway between the start of the curve and the end of the curve. Um, so that, there's lots of ways you can do this uh, to figure out. But 
yeah, when we get to about 27, we're right around there. So you want to get the halfway response during this peak inflection. And so that would give us our end point, our melting point here, the midpoint of our transition. All right, so here is our reverse. See, here is, it looked quite different. Here's the forward, here's the reverse. It looks like it's a much more gradual thing, which means that this is not refolding correctly. Uh, upon a reverse. So it, see the nice inflection point here, but here it's just a gradual uh, decline, which probably implies that it's aggregating in some way instead of uh, forming a nicely refolded piece. And okay. something you always want to watch for in CD um, is is that return if you can to see if it's it's actually folding right. And if it is reversible, then that means we can use some cool PCHEM equations to model its uh, enthalpy and entropies and all those fun things. Um, but at this point, we got our melting point, we got our spectra, we know how much helix we got. Uh, that's about all we can get out of it for now. There's a lot more that this instrument can do, but for now I'm just going to go ahead and shut it down, take my sample out, clean out that compartment. First thing I want to want to do um, is close out the program. And then I'm going to want to follow the instructions, close the Spectre Manager, turn off the power switch. Make sure Spectre Manager is off. Oops. It's important that you do that first, otherwise the system might get hung and then it won't boot up correctly the next time. So that's closed off. Now it's power switch off. Turn off my nitrogen over here at the tank, and then I'm going to close both of my uh, thermal units and back to normal. So um, if you have any questions on that, feel free to, to reach out, but it's a pretty fun instrument.